Welcome, Ben Mama. Perhaps the Philips Video Pack and Magnavox Odyssey 2 might not seem like an obvious choice for one of these amazing facts videos. But I also want to give some love to some of the lesser known systems, as I already did with the MB Vectrix in fact, and hopefully open them up to people who might not be aware of them. Continuing on from the original Odyssey console in 1972, this follow up was first released as the Philips Video Pack in Europe in December 1978, with the renamed North American Odyssey 2 following shortly afterwards in February 1979. It was also released in both Japan and South America, giving the console true worldwide appeal. It seems to be a system that not many people know about outside of the hardcore fanbase, so I was particularly excited to cover it in this video. It's also a console that has some really fascinating stories associated with it, so I'm sure you'll enjoy watching it too. Now let's get learning. I am a Philips video game. Are you skillful enough to navigate in the depths of hyperspace and outfight a constant stream of alien spacecraft? You will need to be deadly accurate and have lightning reactions. Freedom Fighters. One of a cluster of new video games. From Philips. The video pack console was designed around an Intel 8048 microcontroller, using the chip as its CPU. This is rather surprising for a number of reasons. Firstly, because the chip was used in home computers to provide specific functions, such as controlling the keyboard in both the Sinclair QL and TRS-80 Model 2 micros. But what makes this an even more surprising choice is that Philips actually had their own CPU in the form of the Signetix 2650A which was even used in a rival family of consoles known as the Advanced Programmable Video Game System. That includes the Interton VC4000, Astronic MPU1000 and the Voltmace database among many others. Philips had purchased Signetics in 1975 and continued to produce many of their chips under both the Signetics and Philips branding right into the 80s. They obviously didn't have much faith in this chip though, so turned to Intel instead, who is still one of the major CPU manufacturers in the modern day of course. Philips were keen for their own console to seem much more advanced than the rival Atari 2600, so they decided to bless it with many computer-like functions. Most notable of these is the full alphanumeric membrane keyboard on the top, which offered up a number of pretty innovative functions. The first of these was the ability to enter your initials into games to record your score. Then we have a series of even more computer-like functions that could be opened up using a series of add-ons. The computer model brought the ability to program your own games in Microsoft Basic and then save them onto standard cassette tapes. There was also a powerful chess module that added both extra RAM and a secondary CPU to the video pack for those who wanted to become the next Gary Kasparov. And we mustn't forget the voice, which massively boosted the video pack's sound capabilities and even added speech synthesis to compatible games. One of the things that the Odyssey 2 is best remembered for is its pioneering fusion of board games and video games with the Master Strategy series. The first game released in this franchise was Quest for the Rings, which featured gameplay that's somewhat similar to the ever popular tabletop of Dungeons and Dragons, with a storyline that was rather reminiscent of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. It was heavily supported by both TV and print media advertising. Two other games were released in this series in the form of Conquest of the World and The Great Wall Street Fortune Hunt. Each of these also came with its own game board and individual pieces. Neither of these proved as popular as Quest for the Rings and were very costly when compared to traditional board games. All of these games are very sought after by collectors in the present day, especially in complete condition. Casey Munchkin is cartridge number 38 in the official Philips line of games for the Odyssey 2 and Video Pack. The name was an inside joke that referenced then President of Philips Consumer Electronics, Kenneth C. Menkin. The game was designed and programmed by Ed Averett 
and bears an obvious similarity to Namco's 1980 arcade game Pac-Man, although not being a direct clone like so many other maze munchers of the time. It was, however, similar enough for Atari to sue Philips and force them to cease production of the game. Atari held the exclusive home rights for Pac-Man and were very protective of this. Casey Munchkin actually hit store shelves in 1981, a full year before Atari's game, but that didn't stop the Sunnyvale based company going after it. Atari initially failed to convince the US District Court to halt the sale of the game, but ultimately won its case on appeal. In 1982, the court ruled that Phillips had copied Pac-Man and made alterations that only tend to emphasise the extent to which it deliberately copied the plaintiff's work. The ruling was one of the first to establish how copyright law would apply to the look and feel of computer software, and would lead to many similar lawsuits in the future, including several others revolving around the infringement of Pac-Man. By far the rarest model in the range is the Philips Video Pack G7200, which was released exclusively in Europe in 1983. Reminiscent of the rival MB Vectrix in many ways, the G7200 featured a built-in 9-inch black and white screen that gracefully rises from the right-hand side of the console at a slight angle. Obviously, this screen is pretty small and lacks colour, but was designed with portability in mind and you could still connect the console up to a standard colour TV or monitor via a SCART socket on the back of the unit. The two controller connectors are placed discreetly on the front side under the keyboard and there are three different knobs to adjust the contrast, brightness and volume. Schneider and Radiola also marketed this model under their own brands in Germany and Sweden respectively as the Schneider 7200 and Radiola Jet 27. Both of these used a blue instead of white case and are even more sought after than the Philips branded models. Philips even marketed a later more compact model called the Philips N60 that used the Minitel 1A French design Teletext terminal case instead. You might be surprised to learn that the video pack also got a release in Brazil in 1983, where it was known simply as the Philips Odyssey, an amalgamation of both the European and North American monikers. The console proved hugely popular in this region and was the dominant home system until the arrival of the Sega Mars system via Tech Toy some years later. In fact, Philips' console actually became more popular in Brazil than it ever was in the US, where it's perhaps better known, with national tournaments being held and numerous games being fully translated into Portuguese. In some cases, Philips would even completely rebrand their games to cash in on popular Brazilian properties, such as the case of Pickaxe Pete, which became Didi Namina and Quintada. Diddy in the Enchanted Mine, referring to Renato Arageo's comedy character. This became one of the most famous games for the system in Brazil. Tectoy would also adopt this strategy when it came to regionalising many Sega Master System games for Brazil too. It may surprise many people to know that the Philips Video Pack and its regional variants actually finished in third place during its console generation only being beaten out by the beer moth that was the Atari 2600, which nobody was going to catch, and the much more powerful Italian television. Sales were reported to be just over 2 million units worldwide, but that doesn't tell the whole picture, as its biggest market was undoubtedly Europe, where it finished second only to Atari. Ok, this isn't that surprising when you consider that Philips is a Dutch company, and had huge distribution channels throughout Europe. But what is worth knowing is that there are a number of games that came out exclusively in this region, including Exojet, Nightmare, and most notably, a more than competent port of the arcade classic Frogger. The world's very first home console, the Magnavox Odyssey, proved surprisingly successful and opened up the market for others to come and have a go too. The system was designed by the one and only Ralph Bayer, who is often called the founding father of video games, for his contributions to the industry. Anyone who knows anything about the great man knows that he wasn't one to sit in his laurels and continue to play around with different concepts. In 1974, Magnavox was taken over by European electronics giants Philips, who saw a lot of value in the concept of video games, choosing to plough vast sums of money into research and development of them, all headed up by Ralph Baer. In 1975, the Odyssey 100 was released, a standalone Pong clone, and then numerous other plug-and-play consoles soon followed, all following the same concept. 
But as the market became flooded with Pong clones, Philips knew that they would need to come up with something else. So in 1976, they began to develop the Odyssey 2. The original concept was a standalone console with around 25 built-in games. But after seeing the arrival of the Fairchild Channel F, the first console to use ROM cartridges, and hearing that Atari had their own similar console waiting in the wings, they knew they would need to expand on this project, and we all know what the result of that was, don't we? Ralph Baer sadly passed away on the 6th of December 2014, aged 92. His legacy will never be forgotten. Based on the success of the Magnavox Odyssey 2 and video pack in Europe, Philips had already started working on a follow-up console that was due to be released in 1983. This new system would not only be backwards compatible, but also feature state-of-the-art, well for the time anyway, hardware with high resolution backgrounds and sprites as well as a host of other new features. This console would be called the Video Pack G7400 in Europe and unsurprisingly the Odyssey 3 in North America. Rather than a completely new console like Atari had planned with the 5200, the Odyssey 3 was an upgraded version of the original hardware. A good modern comparison to this would be the Xbox One X, which retained full compatibility whilst offering graphical enhancements on compatible games. Philips console would be very much the same with games detecting what chips there was present and adjusting accordingly, very ahead of its time. But anyone who knows their video game history will be well aware of something else much bigger that happened in 1983, the North American video game crash. This decimated the market for consoles and games in Magnavox's home territory and the Odyssey 2 very much became one of the first casualties of that. However, over in Europe, video pack sales were still going strong for Philips, so they decided to plough on regardless, concentrating all support for the system on their own territory. Despite the large market share, sales of the G7400 were disappointing, as most Europeans began to move on to cheap home computers like the ZX Spectrum and Commodore 64. If you want to know more about this story, then follow the link in the top right hand corner or video description, as I've actually done a whole video on this very subject. Perhaps the most surprising fact for fans of the video pack at Odyssey 2 might be that the brands are set to be revived in the future. In 2019, Subvert Limited, a company owned by Paul Andrews of ZX Spectrum Vega and the C64 Mini fame, acquired all rights to both the video pack and Odyssey brands, as well as their respective software catalogues. These were purchased directly from Atari SA, who took ownership of the brands when their former incarnation, Infogrames, took over Philips Studios. Incidentally, this also gives Subvert rights to the Philips CDI and many of its games too. So far, Subvert haven't done anything with the video pack IP, but there's certainly a lot of potential there. We've already seen Subvert re-release a number of CDI games on Steam, and given Paul Landry's previous success with so-called mini consoles, it certainly wouldn't be beyond the realms of belief to expect a video pack mini in the near future. It's definitely something I'd like to see happen, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that either, as there's still quite a following for Philips Classic Console. I am a Philips video board game. Dare you enter my infernal infernos, where the deadly spy draft tarantulas lurks, or attempt to survive with an unmerciful dragon that breathes fire on all living flesh. You will require expert skills and exceptional strategic thinking. The Quest for the Ring one of the new species of video games from Philips. And that rounds up my list of 10 amazing facts about the Philips Video Pack and Magnavox Odyssey 2. Which one of these pieces of trivia did you find the most fascinating? And do you know any other interesting tidbits that I've left out? As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts and views on this subject, so get typing in that comments section, folks. Before I go, though, I must thank all of my little patrons for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following patrons in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Mitchell Valentino, James Taylor, Neptune, Chaotic, Seth Robinson, Carl Olsen, Dos Gamer Man, Tiago Piero Dos Santos Silva, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to host of extra content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the Laird, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.